Hey everyone, thank you so much for checking out the WeVA podcast. We have a super exciting episode today. We have Eric Bernardson and Eddie and Dillocker. Eric is one of the early thought leaders and approximate nearest neighbors, creating the Annoy Library at Spotify, uh, an incredibly interesting algorithm for achieving this approximate nearest neighbor search. And I mean, these two are just such talented engineers with so much experience in building these kind of systems. And we're here to discuss the main topic of vector search in production, running it in production, what does it take? Uh, so Eric, thank you so much for doing the WeVA podcast. Hi, thanks for uh, being here. It's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun, I hope. Yeah, thanks for, for uh, yeah, having me. And of course, Eric, thanks for, for joining. Um, super cool topic. And I think we can we can go into all kinds of different directions for what it means to run ANN in production. I think the first one to start is basically um, the, the history. Like, uh, Connor, you already mentioned uh, Spotify Annoy. And um, yeah, Eric, you worked at Spotify quite some time ago, I think. So yeah, do you want to start maybe telling us a bit about what you did back then as sort of one of the, the first pioneers of, of approximate nearest neighbor search? Yeah, totally. So I spent almost seven years at Spotify. I was there 2008 to 2015. And a, a big part of what I did at Spotify was building the music recommendation system. And I don't want to get like super detailed, like how that works, but like roughly speaking, like we, what we ended up realizing or what I ended up realizing building this is that uh, various types of vector models work really well. So we would, you know, do collaborative filtering on this extremely large sparse matrix of what users listen to. And then, you know, basically some sort of matrix factorization would then lead to vectors. And then once we had those vectors, you know, you could do all these sort of, you know, they, they have this like nice property that you have like a fairly low dimensional space and you can use nearest neighbors to find recommendations for people. So you kind of project users and tracks and artists and albums into this, we typically use like 40 dimensions. And then in that space, turns out like if you want to like find good recommendations for a user, you just look at like similar near vectors for you, vectors that are close to that user. If you want to find similar music to, to a different track, you take that tracks vector and you you look at uh, in this four dimensional space uh, what are some other vectors that are close right and so the problem now is just like you have to figure out how to do this like you have to uh, uh, find nearest vectors uh, fairly fast right and, and in, at spotify we had a few million tracks at that point that was in next in the, in the recommendation system so about i think two million tracks or something like that now it's probably more it's like 10 20 million tracks that are indexed uh, and uh, I looked at a bunch of different approaches and, and a bunch of different ex existing algorithms um, for various reasons. Like one of the things I realized pretty early on was uh, I'm not going to go like super deep, deep, deep into this, but like I, I wanted the functionality to end map it because what, what we wanted at Spotify was we had a fairly static data set, but we needed to do a lot of recommendations very quickly. And you, when you deploy this, you want the ability to basically like, you know, create an index load it into uh, whatever many processes as you have CPUs and then, you know, do all these like nearest neighbor search. So I, I basically built a static file index based on MMAP and, and built Annoy. And Annoy like basically works, you know, kind of splits the tr like the, the point space recursively into a bunch of trees, does that a few times to get a forest. And then in that forest, you can, you can search. Uh, I do want to point out, like, I think actually today there are a bunch of better models. I think Annoy like still is useful in the sense that I think it's like one of the few like kind of like simple like it's just like a file embedded file and it's like it uses MMAP. Uh, but of course, like today, there's VV8 and many other ones uh, that I think probably do a much better job at finding uh, nearest vectors very quickly. Cool, thank you. Super, super cool, cool summary. And yeah, it's it's super exciting to to hear basically how how early you were in in doing these things that are, are now everywhere. And of course, recommendation being a a, a big case. Um, and and I noticed two things I think that we can talk about a, a bit more. Um, one is you said essentially the the uh, recommendation system or the, the recommendation approach was just doing a uh, near vector search. So basically, um, do, I, do I see it correctly that you never had to do online model inference, that you basically did the model inference once, built your index, and then sort of when the user listens to a song or when they select the song, you really just care about the nearest neighbors and never have to deal uh, with the inference or, or did you have to do any inference sort of at what, what we would call query time in VV8, but I guess in Spotify, I don't know, play time. Yeah. I, yeah. I think of it as like online versus offline inference or like batch inference, right? Like we, we did basically zero online inference when I left Spotify. I think they do a lot now, 
but we would actually essentially pre-compute almost everything, right? Like, so, so we would do these, the collaborative filtering models, we would recompute every month or something like that, because they were very large uh, and took a lot of time to do it. Now that would give us a, a track embeddings, right? Like a, a few million track embeddings. Users taste shifts faster. In particular, you have this problem that new users come in and you want to give recommendations to them relatively quickly. So we would recompute those vectors every night. And then every night we would basically go through every user that had some activity last 24 hours and then pre-compute recommendations for those users. And I don't know if that's like a particularly efficient approach. It just turned out that like the way we built, had the system set up at that time made it a lot easier to do everything in sort of a batch oriented way. And so that might also explain some of the design decisions of how Annoy worked. Uh, it's quite optimized for more like throughput rather than like sort of online latency. Uh, in particular, the, you know, talked about the MMAP, you know, it's quite optimized for, for doing a lot of multi using multi-processing and, and doing a lot of things in parallel. Uh, but um, there's probably many other ways you can do it today. And, and I'm sure Spotify today does a lot more like sort of real-time stuff, right? Like as you start listening to the music, probably I'm guessing they, you know, update that vector in real time and do inference. But I mean, there's still like batch different stuff going on in Spotify, right? Like Discover Weekly, you know, is only recomputed every week. Uh, so I, I think there's still, you know, use cases for both online inference and offline inference. Yeah, cool. So, so super cool. This, this um, the, uh, sort of the, the, yeah, doing the inference in batches and then having that static data set that you mentioned. Um, I, I think this is, yeah, as you said as well, it, it's shifting a bit, but I think this is for me, one of the typical cases where you can easily make this, this distinction between uh, a search library and ANN search library that typically is built for that static case. So beyond, beyond annoy, if we look at uh, phase or, or Google scan or all these libraries, typically they're built for those sort of build once then surf kind of use case. Um, and, and, and this is for me, an, a nice point to sort of draw the distinction or do the distinction between what is a library and what is a database is when we started with VV8, one of the things that we, we wanted to give our users basically from the get-go is an experience as they would have in any other database. So not so much from the like, okay, you're starting with a library and now you're trying to, to sort of get the library as a service, but the other way around, you're, you're starting from a, from a database. Like you may be, uh, you're used to, to using MySQL database or, or, um, no SQL, this doesn't matter, but basically any database in the world, you can incrementally sort of build up your data set. You can do updates, you can do filtering, these kind of things. And that is something that, that we, yeah, basically that led our decision um, to start with HNSW as the first uh, vector index. We, we definitely did look at Annoy. I think we even had prototypes before uh, with, with Annoy. Um, we used it also in this, this uh, contextionary that we have till this day, which is basically like a very simple a simple uh, bag of words model, which is sort of static. It's, it's built on, on a glove or fast text. So we have this kind of static. And if you just want to search within there, uh, we used Annoy for that. Um, but yeah, that, that that kind of sort of online changeability, that, that was definitely one of the, the reasons why we looked into, into HNSW. And yeah, definitely one of the, the parts that make sort of VV8 a database as opposed to, to a library, I would say. I think there's kind of maybe two things going on at the same time, right? Like there's like the, the sort of online offline distinction, right? Like, and, and you look at like a machine learning model, uh, you know, you can either use that machine learning model of an online inference or an offline inference, right? And, 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 and then the, the separate aspect is, is the sort of the, the CRUD support, like supporting like, you know, CRUD, like what is it, was it set for? Create, read, update, delete, like the ability to mutate the data set, right? And, 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 and I think, you know, like my, my sort of, I think the sort of ideal here is like a, a service that does all four combinations of those two attributes, right? And, and, and also does it with zero sort of performance loss. Because I think, you know, the, the online case is a lot harder than the offline case in many cases, right? Because you need a lower light latency. And I think, I, you know, it's easy to sort of give up a lot of the throughput by optimizing for the online case. But I actually don't think you have to. Uh, I also think that sometimes we talk, you know, when I look at like machine learning as a whole, people generally tend to think of like model inference as primarily like an online thing. But if you actually like, like there's like, you know, 5,000 startups that do like, you know, model deployments, right? But if you look at actually how people use models in, in you know, real life, I would say, you know, it's fairly evenly split between batch inference and online inference, right? Uh, batch inference generally has a lot more, you know, uh, uh, it's more important that you have a lot of throughput. So I, I think 
but but I actually think there's ways you can build your system that you get you know the same throughput even in an online mode. You just have to be smart about uh, you know batching and, and other things. Uh, so so I, to me that's like the dream that and you know and I, I think Weavian hopefully delivers on those things. I haven't done any benchmarks, uh, but but I, I think it actually does. Yeah, I think on the on the the model inference part, uh, there's definitely room to to grow. Um, but on the latency part, on on the search, definitely. Um, but yeah, so so batching, I guess, sort of when we think of of batching in in a DML sense, it's typically like this offline batching. But you can still do like a a, a mini batching approach, right? Where you just do the batch just big enough to basically have the benefits of say running on a GPU, which parallelizes a much, uh, enough. Um, but still have it sort of in a real-time approach where maybe instead of sending uh, or in, instead of doing a uh, hundred single inference tasks that would then have to run sequentially, just batch those hundred up, which happen maybe, I don't know, in, in over the course of 50 milliseconds or so, and then have them batch and, and, and basically get the throughput this way, like trade up a bit of latency for, for the higher throughput. I, I think this is especially important when you have like matrix algebra going on in your system, right? Like either, you know, especially when you're using GPUs, right? Because like GPUs benefit a lot from batching. If you don't do that, then you might as well just like run everything with separate threads and it's like kind of fine. You know, you have some locking issues, but that's fine. Um, but I, I think the sort of mini batching or micro batching that you see in some high performance model serving frameworks, uh, they do benefit quite a lot when, uh, when you're using matrix algebra. Cool. Yeah. So maybe at this point is a good good point to to tell a bit about the different options that people have or that users have to do inference with with VV8. Because um, as you said, some like to do it offline and just sort of only basically do the re-index part with VV8. So this would be the typical case where the users provide their own vectors and they're not using VV8 end to end, but basically batch indexing and or do maybe doing some kind of a blue green deployment where class A, so so classes are the, the isolation units in VV8, where class A would be serving uh, the data with the old model. Um, you can prepare class B, build up the index in the background, and then uh, basically just switch the load balancer from one to another to, to do this, this kind of shift. So this would be like the, the weekly example. Um, but then also for the, the, the live in inference parts so with VV8's module system, which basically gives you the ability to plug in um, yeah, any kind of kind of model really, and and not just any model, but also any model provider to do the the end to end inference. And there, what we recently added is support for for the Hugging Face API. So basically, one of those hosted uh, inference service types, um, so that you can really basically do do all three variants that you want to do. And then, of course, if, if we're talking about the the combination with CRUD, all of them them can be combi uh, combined with with the CRUD uh, part of, of the database. But you could basically bring your own vectors, which um, sort of gives you full control about how you do the inference. You could you could do it live, you could do it, or you could do it online, you could do it offline. Uh, you can do it with um, sort of hosted together with VV8. So VV8 module system then just brings a small inference container. Uh, there you can you can still sort of split this up into do you take what what sort of uh, what VV8 provides and just plug in your model or do you replace the entire container? So for example, if you say, I can do this better, I can optimize this better or something, I can do it. Or now the, the new option is basically um, if you want the no ops approach, just put uh, use one of those those uh, third party providers where we're, we're supporting a hugging face, Cohere, I think, and oh, and open AI also. So with those those three, um, basically, yeah, gives you the ability to plug those in. I think this is super cool. I, I, I mean, I don't know, like kind of reflecting on this as like, you know, as someone who like spent time on this like a decade ago or more, right? Like I, w when I discovered this like vector approach, like I, I, like I was actually just talking to someone the other day, but like, I actually feel like that's like one of the most profound insights I've had in my life was like this like vector approach, you know, when I realized it back in like 2008, I'm like, this makes so much sense. Like you have this like nice space and like you can think of things in terms of, you know, Euclidean, <laughs> you know, geometry, right? And, 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 and you know, and, and that sort of mental leap for me was like re realizing like once you embed all these things into the space, like a lot of sort of, you know, relations become more like natural. The hard part is the query, right? And, and like 10 years ago or 15 years ago when I was doing this, like it was very hard to query. So I basically like had to roll up my sleeves and like build this like C++ library with, with Python bindings uh, that I could import and, and like use, you know, for, for my... Uh, janky Hadoop jobs. Uh, but I always like was a huge believer in sort of vector uh, models 
And, and so I'm like, it, one part of me is like extremely excited and sort of the world has come around to like realize like the sort of power of vectors. And, and I'm very excited about, you know, the sort of the new databases are coming out, the new vetting models and, and sort of a general just like acceptance or like, you know, sort of embracing of, you know, the, the fact that we're in a vector space, like you can use these like vector models for a lot of stuff. And, and, and like what, I, what I'm excited about is like I, I look at the, you know, I look at all these like technology in the past, you know, like, you know, various search algorithms or uh, various types of ways we did like recommendation relevance in the past. Like, I think there's like a huge opportunity to just take a step back and like rethink so much of that from, from ground up. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and so you know, pretty excited, you know, we had this working on that kind of stuff and, but also many, many other players, right? Like, you know, in particular, like, you know, it's not outside of search. There's also a lot of like work on embeddings and other things I think is really exciting. So that's fun to see. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more. And, and we're, we're basically, even though you, you mentioned 2008, right? So even though it's 14 years later, I think we're, we're still basically, we're, we're still at the beginning. Like it's, it's such a massive trend and it's, it's gonna, yeah, it, it's gonna change search, but, but goes beyond search. And then we're really just at the beginning, but yeah, what I also really like is this kind of growing together with the space. And I think that was something that we tried to be, be like from the get go, um, while VV8 can be used end-to-end, -end, like that end-to-end -end user experience is super important. We never said we need to entirely own the chain end-to-end. -end. Like we would say, I don't know, you could only use it with models that we train or something. And all of a sudden we're competing with these specialized startups and then not just startups, also Google and Facebook and then all of them are meta now. Um, but, but really just say like, okay, we, we want to integrate with those players in the space and basically grow grow VV8 with the space, but also help grow the space with VV8, basically, in this kind of kind of partnership. I think that's a good approach. I mean, in general, like I would say, when I look at machine learning, like I, I think, you know, it's kind of bifurcating a little bit where like, you're going to have the, you know, the Googles and Facebooks and, you know, the other big providers like training these like enormously complex, very large models, OpenAI, DeepMind and Cohere and a few other ones, right? And most people want, to, want me to train a model. Like they could just like take these models and use the embeddings that come out of these models or use the predictions or whatever, right? Like embeddings are often like the, the penultimate or the, 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 you know, sort of some intermediate layer in these models. Uh, and, and then like do their own, you know, sort of fine tuning on top of that. So I, I think that's like a big shift in like how people work with machine learning also in the last five, 10 years, or five years, and maybe even like three years, honestly. Uh, but I think it also opens up, you know, sort of makes it a lot easier to, to, to use these models, right? Like in the past, when I did things, I had to do the whole thing end to end, right? Like now I can just like download a transformer model from Hugging Face and, and do, you know, two thirds of it. And I can like throw some like simple stuff on top of it, which makes it a lot easier to do these things and with great quality too. There are so many like pre-trained models for English and, and computer vision and I mean, any language really. And, 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 and those models make the life a lot easier for a lot of these, uh, for, for people trying to build their recommendations or classification or any sort of, you know, industry uh, machine learning application. Yeah, and it's, and it's basically getting better day by day. So another topic that I want to talk about is benchmarks. You're, of course, um, famous for, for the ANN uh, benchmark website. But before we go into that, um, we talked a bit about, about what you did at, at Spotify, but I'm also super curious about what you're doing right now. And um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on this uh, startup called Modal. I, I started it, uh, I would say, about a year ago. And we're still pretty early days, uh, but the idea is, I'm, I'm sort of basically like, I guess like the best way to put it is like, I'm, I'm building the data tool I always wanted to have for 20 years. And so I, I found that like, when you look at data teams, how they operate and how they productionize things and how to scale things out and schedule things like, and how they work with infrastructure and the tools they have, it's all kind of janky. Like there's, you know, there's so much like time wasted on like, you know, dealing with infrastructure, product, you know, setting things up, like dealing with Kubernetes and Docker and, you know, AWS and Terraform and Helm and all this stuff. Right. And, and, and I think as a, as a result, you know, like building code and running data applications today, you know, takes five times as much time as it should do. Uh, I, I mean, I literally like, you know, I've been wasting like the last three days, like trying to configure like VPCs and AWS. And like, I really think that's like hell for a developer to ever have to deal with. Uh, and, um, and so, so what is Modal? Like, yeah, Modal basically, like, you know, we built our own sort of Lambda style, like infrastructure provider for data jobs, right? Like we, we make it very simple to take code and productionize that in the cloud. Like we are a cloud provider in that sense. Like we take people's code, put it in containers and run it in the cloud. And we can do that extremely fast because we ended up building our own 
uh, a container runtime and, and a bunch of other stuff for own file system and, and many other things. And so the end result is like, you know, if you want to do, especially if you're an early stage tech company, you don't want to set up all this like traditional, you know, the, the, all the infrastructure uh, using model, you can, you can immediately, you know, do everything from like, you know, uh, schedule retraining of your jobs to deploying inference to scaling out like large scale, like batch inference, like, you know, large scale uh, mapping over, you know, various types of sort of embarrassingly parallel tasks like transcoding, web scraping, simulations and back testing and, and, and other things. And, and, and do build a lot of end to end infrastructure for machine learning, but also like other like, you know, more like mundane data tasks like reporting or whatever. Uh, and do that very easily without having to think about infrastructure. So sort of, you know, kind of selfishly building a tool I was wanted to have, but, uh, you know, also sort of think that many other people would benefit from this tool as well. Really cool. I, I saw, I think it was a screenshot or, or a short uh, video on, on Twitter where you shared basically the API. And do I understand it correctly that I can basically write Python code and I just annotate a function and then it runs in the cloud? Yeah, and, and I think that it's a sort of this idea that I think other people have had too, which is sort of people sometimes refer to as the self-provisioning runtime, like the idea that like everything is just code, right? And the code itself specifies what sort of infrastructure it needs, including the container specification, the parallelism, like all these other things. And then when you run the code, the code just like gets those resources in the cloud for itself. So it's a sort of idea of, you know, you take the app code, but you also put in all that, you know, cont container code and environments and and cron jobs and, and and credentials and all this stuff and just like write all of it in code right like there's like no config in modal like everything is just code and um which makes it very concise makes it very easy to run and um uh makes it a lot easier to maintain right and, and so yeah like everything in code uh is just something i don't know if you ever looked at pulumi but it's sort of the same idea but taking it even further pulumi only does the infrastructure in code like we also do the we do everything like the infrastructure and the app code together uh, all in python Really, really cool. Can can users try this out? Like, can, can I just could I just register right now, or in, in in what state is it, or would I have to wait a bit? For... No, <laughs> but but we're working on it. So we're still in early beta stage test, right? And we have a bunch of users using this uh, and a few paying customers. And and so we're we're you know we're slowly scaling up. And and you know if you want if you're interested in modal, feel free to go to modal.com and join the wait list. Um, you know we, we're sort of definitely going to make more announcements in the next few months and. and gradually open up and add more beta testers. Uh, so if you're interested in trying it out, definitely go to model.com and sign up or, or, or put, put your name on the wait list. Cool. Nice. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, we we uh, talked about model. I mentioned uh, benchmarks. And of course, there is ANN benchmarks, which um, is, I would say, the de facto standard for comparing, um, yeah, comparing a vector search. I don't want to say either libraries or databases because I guess you technically have a, a mix of them in there, but maybe I'm just going to say algorithms and their implementations. Would, would that be correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. And, and it's mostly libraries. Like it sort of started out at almost, you know, five, 10 years ago. And, and back then it was mostly libraries around. I, I mean, a and m Benchmarks was like one of these projects that like I got annoyed because I would read like various like papers at conferences and they all had their own like obscure like benchmark setups. And, and of course, like every... I mean, I'm also biased because I built the Noi, but like every library maintainer, I, I felt at that time would build their own benchmark suite, and you know, the world looked like their library was the fastest. Um, and and I, and I found a lot of you know very frustrating when also people sometimes would come up with new types of like A and algorithms and like and not benchmark them, right? Like one of the things I was always was frustrated with is just like this research and locality sensitive hashing. Well, is that's imagine like basically it doesn't work in my opinion. Like it's a terrible algorithm, but like people would keep releasing papers about it because it had these like nice mathematical properties. But like if you actually run the benchmarks on it, it's just like awful. And, and so, yeah, so there's a couple of different reasons why I was frustrated and ended up building my own benchmarking suite. And this shit was kind of janky and you had to, to, to like install all this stuff and it barely would work. But uh, a few years in, I actually set it up in a nice way of sort of containerized everything and made it easy to reproduce added more libraries uh and, and so yeah so it's grown pretty extensive benchmark suite I, I think it's showing a little bit of age in the sense that it doesn't support crud it, it's very you know it, all it does is like you know uh, a, a kind of static offline uh batch inference and, and really just meshes throughput uh so, so kind of going back to the first thing we talked about it doesn't handle you know the crud case it doesn't really benchmark that it also doesn't really benchmark latency uh, so, so some libraries or databases may optimize for latency at the cost of throughput. Uh, and uh, sorry, a and benchmark doesn't really optimize for that, or it doesn't really take that into account. Um, but I, I think all in all, like you know, to me, like 
it was something at that time that maybe still uh, that was very much needed in the space because there's all these like libraries out there making claims about you know the performance uh, and uh, until any of the benchmarks I basically didn't feel like there was like a sort of a neutral semi quasi neutral because I'm the, again I'm the author of Noi too but but you know sort of benchmark suite that actually try to compare all of those yeah. Yeah, and then, I mean the the fact that you're not trying to sell something with it, I think that that sort of gives you a lot more credibility. Like if if we as semi would basically put out some sort of a comparative benchmark right now, where we would benchmark, let's say, VV8 against I don't know our competitors or something, I think that would be you would always have to take that with a, a grain of salt. And I mean, you, you should <laughs> because um, so, so yeah, it's really yeah, I agree. Yeah, and there's all these like weird ways you can like kind of fake it too. Like one of the things I, I kind of was you know felt with the noise with sort of A and N like it's kind of hard too because it's sort of a weird trade off between like okay what is the desired recall and what is the desired throughput right like if you if you want to maximize throughput you can like you know make the recommendations really terrible and vice versa if you want to you know make the recall extremely good then you can like you know uh, uh, you know make it very slow and, and so one of the things I also uh, it did it in and benchmarks that push for a lot is, is sort of you know you have to look at the the whole frontier like the whole Pareto frontier of like you have to do, actually make a 2d plot and like you know plot the trade-off curves and do that for every single library and, and what that means is like for every library you have to run all these like different parameters and, and then compute that as sort of you know the trade-off curve after the fact like after you have all that data so so it, it, it's sort of it's, it's a little bit tricky to, to do that thing you, you actually have to run you know, last time I ran it, it, it took, I think, something like two weeks to run all the benchmarks. Uh, and uh, there's a fair amount of compute that goes into uh, re rebuilding those benchmarks. So if, if anyone is asking, like, why I haven't, I haven't updated it in a while, it's because it just takes a little bit of time to set everything up and then run it. But I should do that at some point again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Super cool. Yeah, and I think that that frontier curve, so I think everyone who's looked at some kind of ANN benchmark or, or a sort of a non-comparative vector search benchmark, everyone knows those kind of graphs where like top and to the right is is best. <laughs> so that's, that's yeah, it's nice to hear that you came up with that because um, basically the first time I looked at an ANN benchmark, which was ANN benchmarks, that was just there. So I didn't even, didn't even think about that. Yeah, someone had to come up with that at some point. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know if like, I necessarily invented that. I'm sure there was in some older papers too. But I definitely, you know, I do think that in that benchmarks like pushed for that and sort of popularized that and, you know, made that, you know, the sort of the, hopefully the de facto way to compare things is like, you know, looking at the, the 2D frontier, of, you know, making that trade off very explicit, I think is very important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in, in our benchmarks that we have, which are not comparing VV8 against something else, but we're just basically showing like, this is how VV8 performs under these circumstances. We also have that. And and it's I think this is a good tool as well, this this kind of frontier just to, to educate users because um, and I, I've had a couple of conversations with users who were saying like, oh, I, I want ANN, this is so cool. Um, I, I'm using this ANN system. And then they're like, why doesn't it have perfect recall? And then a conversation typically goes like, D do you know, like, are you aware what ANN is? Like the A in ANN stands for approximate nearest neighbors. That's basically that trade-off between recall and, and people like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. But then having those kind of graphs and seeing like, even in an approximate nearest neighbor situation, you can still achieve high recall. You just need to need to basically give up a bit of, of latency and throughput and just use the benchmark as a as a guide basically of how to set parameters and how to configure it. I think that's that's also super, super helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Just gonna say the same thing. Ah, so that's maybe not a coincidence. <laughs> maybe some, some kind of subconscious <laughs> decision. Fun fact, one of my daughter's name is Anne, A-N-N, -N, but it's not, it's a pure coincidence. We had that name in the family. And uh, although I, she was born after we had benchmarks, so, so maybe it was subconsciously influenced. Do you also have a child called K-N-N? -N? <laughs> It's a little bit harder to pronounce, but uh, yeah, yeah, may maybe, maybe one day. Yeah, the fact, the funny thing is, I haven't really thought about that until now. It's kind of weird. Maybe I did name her after approximate nearest neighbors. I'm gonna tell her that when she's when she's older. Yeah. So so um, benchmarks. Um, basically, we we've talked a bit about the the value that they provide, and um, I, I think in a in a sense, it's um, it's really good to to have or to to give you these kind of insights in um into how these these algorithms perform 
And at the same time, I think as a user, how much do you care basically? Like, is there a point where you go, okay, it's just fast enough or do I need to, like, of course, everyone wants to have the, the best, but um, yeah, what is sort of, if we're talking about, let's say um, a two millisecond versus a four millisecond latency, like, is this something that matters to the user? I mean, my opinion is like, you know, it, it, like going to a hundred percent, I don't think is ever worth it. because there's like a point where it just like takes longer and longer to like really, you know, essentially you're just, you're just doing like exhaustive search. But like, if you can get to like 99.9%, you know, that's like usually like pretty much like good enough, right? That's like almost as good as like hundred percent. And, you know, going to 99.9 or like whatever, like 99, uh, that usually ends up being like a 10 X or hundred X improvement over exhaustive search, or maybe even more a thousand X if you have like, you know, very large data set. And so I, I think that's kind of the sweet spot is like, you know, for, for most users, if I just had a pick a point for them, I'd probably pick, you know, the nine, you know, the, the three nines, 99.9, the, that percentile. And, you know, that's close enough to hundred percent that practice, you know, won't be a problem. Uh, but still, you know, implies like a pretty, you know, substantial performance improvement. But I'm curious what you think, Etienne, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, um, definitely, like I, I kind of looked at this from the perspective of, of latency and not so much recall, but I, I like the way that you're looking at this of sort of optimize for recall first and then see what, what latency you, you get. And uh, the point that, that I was going to make is basically um, that, let's say uh, these two numbers that I just said, like two milliseconds or four milliseconds, I think for the kind of SLOs that users have to meet for, for whatever they're doing on top of, of vector search, they're probably not serving pure vector search to the users. So they're probably building some kind of application on top. Um, let's say they have a hundred, hundred millisecond SLO for, for um, the end-to-end -end thing. Then it's probably not going to matter if it's two milliseconds or if it's four milliseconds. However, this you, you can't really look at latency in isolation because latency probably also ties into throughput, at least for the same same kind of hardware cost. Like assuming that, that um, it scales linearly across threads and you have a single thread and on that single thread, it's two milliseconds or four milliseconds, that's basically twice the throughput. And um, that I think is, is much more interesting. And there, I think if, if, we, if we take this one step further and think about how do you actually run uh, ANN in production and um, for example, using the VV at cloud service, where we now have usage-based pricing, then it, it, it sort of, it, I think it becomes a matter of, of good enough. Like I need this kind of, kind of latency SLO and I need this kind of throughput, but I can basically get the throughput through horizontal scaling, which of course increases your infrastructure cost. But if you have usage-based pricing, then you don't really care so much about the, the infrastructure cost. So that's basically where I think, yeah, you need to kind of prove that it's fast and fast enough and that it's never going to be too slow to achieve your, your goals. But at the same time, yeah, in the end, it's basically, it's, it's more kind of an, an optimization that we have to do internally to, to run more profitable on the VVAT cloud service than, than what the user should ultimately end up caring about. Yeah. And it is of course use case specific, right? It, like what is the cost of a true, of a false negative, right? So, so, so basically like, you know, the fact that like there was something in the result set that, you know, the, the, the ANN algorithm didn't find, right? And it's, it's going to be very high for search, right? Like, you know, if the user is searching for something and you don't find it, like that's kind of a bad experience, right? For recommendations, like not so much, right? Like if, if you're just making a recommendation, if you want to recommend like, you know, 20 tracks, you know, to someone at Spotify and it turns out like actually, you know, if you had done an exhaustive search, you know, the, the you know the, the 21st track wouldn't have been there because it would have been another track like no one's going to notice right so I, I think it's extremely you know so, so for maybe like recommendations like you you don't have to go to like you know 99.9 percent .9%. maybe it's fine to go to like 95th percentile like i don't know right and and, and that's you know those are the trade-offs you have to think about yeah yeah great point yeah yeah and i think also you should take into account how good is your model actually at predicting, like, even if you have a hundred percent recall, that doesn't mean that, that from a user's perspective, the, the match is good. If the model just created bad embeddings, basically, like it could be the, the true nearest neighbor, but just, yeah, it was just the wrong embedding basically. Yeah. And, and I also wonder to what extent, you know, people then end up like, you know, doing sort of a multi-stage re-ranking anyway, like at Spotify, what we ended up doing was we actually had an ensemble method. Although I think they changed that later, 
Uh, but but so what we would do was we actually had not just one vector model, but we had you know I don't know half a dozen vector models plus a bunch of other stuff. And and so what we would do was like we would use each of these vector models, uh, you know, to search for candidates. And so for each you know if we had to generate a hundred recommendations from user, we would ask you know each vector model like give me a thousand vec- you know tracks right, and then we'd pull them and then we end up with like five thousand tracks. And then we would, you know, we would basically re-rank it using an XG boost, uh, gradient boost decision tree, based on a bunch of other features too. Uh, that, that you know, uh, all kinds of like, you know, s- some of them are like not at all like collaborative filtering vector based. Like some of them were just like, is it Christmas? Then you know we should boost Christmas. Like there's like all these like you know weird features, right? And then we would re-rank based on that. And 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 I think, I don't know. I, I think it depends on the use case. Like I think. You know, sort of advanced, you know, the, the companies, machine learning practitioners like Spotify or, you know, larger like e-commerce applications. I, I think they're always going to have this like multi-stage approach. Um, but of course, like, you know, for a lot of like early stage startups or, or a lot of, you know, customers that don't have, you know, a whole machine learning department, they might just want to take the, the, the output from the embedding uh, and just return that to a customer. And, and I think that's going to be good enough in many cases. Yeah, or, or do some some minimal kind of re-ranking with them. So, for example, then we're we're getting in the direction of hybrid search. Where um, so for for our listeners, hybrid search is basically the the idea that um, if we're in the context of of text, you have your dense vector model that basically yeah creates your your vector embeddings, but you also have traditional search, so to speak. So BM twenty five BM twenty five F these kind of algorithms that um, boost keywords or boost keyword matches or, or phrase matches, etc. And um, yeah, with hybrid search, the idea is to, to combine both of them and um, combining can be independent. Combining could mean that you do some sort of minimal yeah, re-ranking or, or boosting based on, on keywords based in like, like do the vector search first boost on keywords or do it the other way around. Um, and um, that can already also help basically overcome limitations of either the ANN algorithm if the recall isn't high enough or the model. So. Uh, um, uh, uh, text model centers transformer models, for example, they they perform pretty bad out of domain for for exact matches. So that is something that can be overcome with with hybrid search. And there, I think we're also trying to to really lower the barriers of of entry um, for yeah, as you said, for for like smaller startups that don't have a whole AI department working on this by making this easier and easier with with VBA. Yeah, totally. And I'm kind of curious about like the evolution. I mean, this may be a side topic, but like, I feel like, you know, 10 years ago, like, you know, you would just start with like, you know, something like Elastic doing like inverted indexes. And that would be like, you know, you would productionize that and then you would have search, right? And then, you know, now today it feels like, okay, you start with like maybe, you know, inverted indexes or you start with vector databases. And then at some point, you know, you start adding features and you start breaking it up into like a multi-stage pipeline. You have like both vector and, you know, inverted indexes working conjunction. Then you throw in a bunch of other features too. And then you throw in like, you know, throw in like XG boost on top of that or whatever. And, and, you know, and you have this like, you know, three, four stages of, you know, candidate generation, candidate re-ranking, filtering, right? Like I, I, I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, what, what do you see in the world? Like, you know, of search and relevance today, uh, is, is that sort of an accurate way to think about it? Oh yeah, abs- absolutely. And I, I think you have all stages, basically you have companies doing just one stage, two stage, you have multiple stages. Like we have use cases where we're from our perspective as semi, basically, we don't even see what's happening. Like all we know is the customer tells us, well, we use VV8 for candidate generation. And then we have that that kind of pipeline on top of it. And of course that that is something that's that's specific to them and 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 probably where all their magic is happening and something that they're not going to be very vocal about because that's that's kind of their their secret sauce so yeah sometimes we as the database provider as the vector search provider we only see that that first stage the candidate generation stage um but even in that candidate st- uh, generation stage i think we can so so for example with hybrid search we can incorporate like a bit more on, on uh, of that part and who knows maybe uh later on it could be even even higher that you could do four stage ranking or, or, or search with, with VB8. yeah I, I think that makes sense because like I, if i think you know users will generally start with something that you know does the, the simple thing the sort of you know pure vector approach right but like you know over time you know as they get more and more advanced like you know it's sort of nice to to sort of offer those things too like as they start to think about you know re-ranking and and, and, you know, multi-stage pipelines. Um, 
I think like offering that, you know, as a black box or not, not actually as a black box, but like as kind of a gray box, like, you know, you can feed some data into it, but you know, hundred percent sure how it works. And to, to me, that makes a lot of sense as a product. Yeah. One, one uh, sort of two-stage uh, pipeline approach that we, we've actually had for a while, but I keep forgetting that it's a two-stage approach is the, the question answer extraction that you can do with VV8, where basically you just have the, the dense or whatever uh, a search you use as, as candidate retrieval. And basically use the the question answer extraction model that also returns a score as a re-rank step, or even if you even if you don't do the re-ranking, just to extract the the uh, the kind of information from that text snippet. That's a, a very simple, but it's also a two-stage kind of pipeline that you can also do out of the box, basically with VBA. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. At Spotify, an incredibly important uh, sort of one stage in the filter, in the pipeline was was just like removing tracks that the user had already listened to, which kind of makes sense. Like if you're recommending music, you obviously don't want to recommend tracks the users already listened to. So, so, so that was the, the last step in the pipeline. We basically use Bloom filters for that because uh, it's very space efficient. Uh, so we would recompute Bloom filters every night and then use those uh, sort of binary representations uh, to filter out the candidates uh, very quickly. So we didn't have to. So, so actually, it wasn't the last stage. We would, we would generate candidates, remove everything that was already in the Bloom filter, and then and then re-rank the resulting ones. And Bloom filter also has uh, false negatives, right? Like Bloom filters will occasionally uh, flag something as belonging in the. I guess you should call it false positive, but it, but from the user's point of view, it turns into false negative. They will they will sometimes think that you know sometimes because the Bloom filter has is approximate, we would think that okay the user had already listened to this track, but actually they didn't. It was just like a false positive. So we would then remove that, turning it into false negative, where the user wouldn't actually get that recommendation. Because you know the Bloom filter thought that the user already had listened to it, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm just like mentioning as like you know sort of one example of like you know one stage in this like multi-stage pipeline that I'm talking about, and I think everyone everyone's pipeline will look a little bit different depending on the use case. Yeah, yeah. When you think of of stages, it, it always sounds like super complex, but it can be something super simple. Is that I, what I really like is that you're essentially using database technology. There are plenty of Bloom filters in in VV8 just for the the object store, which is an LSM based store and, and super cool that you were yeah using using bloom filters there as well um so what, what i find super interesting about removing this in the last part um if i understand it correctly that is essentially a post filtering step so in the worst case you could run into a situation where you would run out of candidates like if the if the user has listened to everything then everything would be removed from the search yeah so that that's another uh, a situation where where i think the the pre-filtering that you can do in vv8 would be super helpful these days because you can just remove them before generating the candidates yeah and i don't know if that was in practice i think it's in theory would was a problem at spotify but in practice we generated so many candidates that it kind of we i mean we would generate like ten thousand candidates for every user right like plus you know and, and do that you know times like a number of different models that are all vector based. So so in the end, like pooling those, like we went out and they went up with like 20, 30,000 candidates and then we rank them. Well, first, like filter out using blue filter, then we rank them, right? Uh, so I, I think in practice, like for, you know, occasionally they would end up with like, you know, maybe one less recommendation. But but uh, I think in almost every case, like we had it more than plenty. Yeah, great example of basically you need to do whatever is right for your use case. I could imagine search cases where that would be be very problematic. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. I'm looking at the time, see where we're approaching our our end. This was super fun, super super nice to to hear. Yeah, hear. Yeah, <laughs> hear about Spotify and Noi. Hear about. Um, yeah, A and N benchmarks, and then of course about modal. So do check out modal. As we heard, you can't register yet, but you can. Well, you can register for the for the wait list, right? So <laughs> do do that, and uh, check out VV8 as well. If you if if maybe Eric was the reason you got here and not not VV8, and if you haven't heard of VV8, then check out that as well. Check out our our other videos. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for for coming. Had a great time. Yeah, so it's fun to talk about this stuff. Thanks so much, Eric.